in recent years, folks have become more familiar with, with disparities in care and disproportionately negative outcomes. So I'm very personally driven in this work and passionate about it, as well as, you know, just grateful for the increased opportunity for institutions to really do sustainable, meaningful change to promote equity. Welcome to Living My Breastless Life podcast. I'm your host, HPG. On season three of the podcast, we're diving in to the helping profession. I have found that almost always there's a catalytic event that leads people to help others. You'll hear a variety of folks share what they do, why they do it, and the unique ways that they help. This season will mostly be guest interviews with some fascinating people and a few surprises for y'all along the way. So let's go. 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 On episode 48, I had the pleasure of talking to Dr. Sharon Washington. Dr. Washington shares some vulnerable insight into her past, racial inequities, and what she is doing to help with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sharon has worked with various healthcare, corporate, academic, and government agencies to provide executive coaching, develop and implement curriculum, and guide organizational growth. She has also created an online learning platform with self-directed content to increase awareness, allyship, and accomplishment. I am fascinated by my conversation with Dr. Washington, and I think you will be too. Dr. Washington, please share what you do. Sure. So I work within the diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism space, and I am an educator and consultant. I run my own consulting business, Sharon Washington Consulting, since 2019, and I work primarily with healthcare providers, leaders, faculty, and healthcare institutions whether that's uh, where clinical care is being provided, like hospitals and clinic settings, but also academic institutions like medical schools, residencies, nursing schools, et cetera, and really try to support organizational change through assessments and creating climate surveys and tracking the experiences of marginalized folks within those institutions, but also really fostering individual and personal development change and growth through education. I have an online learning platform called Critically Conscious Connections, where people can purchase courses and access to training materials, as well as institutions utilize courses and integrate them into their training, onboarding, and long-term curriculum in order to help learners and faculty and leaders to be able to bring a critical consciousness of social determinants of health, health equity, a trauma-informed approach to teaching and facilitating healing, and really employ within people the tools and resources to stay present in the midst of cross-racial, cross-cultural dynamics, um, to stay grounded in and awareness of themselves and others in order to really bring an authentic approach to leading and facilitating equity in healthcare. That is wonderful. Thank you for fighting the good fight. Oh, thank you. We need more of you in the world. Oh, well, thank you. I am really passionate about doing this work. I think not only as an educator, thinker, and contributor, but also as a patient, as someone who navigates healthcare as someone who's given birth in the healthcare system with a Black body, and I've embodied and experienced many of the statistics that, especially in recent years, folks have become more familiar with, with disparities in care and disproportionately negative outcomes. So I'm very personally driven in this work and passionate about it, as well as you know, just grateful for the increased opportunity for institutions to really do sustainable, meaningful change to promote equity. 
So I want to ask you what led you to this amazing career path. I think it, for me, starts very early in my childhood, actually. Around the time I was about four, my family moved from Oakland, California, to a rural farm town in Oregon. And in that process, I was very much exposed to just blatant, violent, aggressive acts of racism from people vandalizing our house, getting death threats and bomb threats that lasted for the first three to five years. Just really being exposed to the violence and the trauma of being different was something that shaped so much of my early childhood. Also, in my early life, I developed a condition called linear scleroderma, where the tissue on the left side of my face atrophied, as well as some of the bone structure of the left side of my face. And so that was something that was very painful. It was a very physically painful process to have my skin, my tissue, my bone structure changing and atrophying. And how people treated me was an added layer of difference. I had to wear a helmet when I was doing any physical activity from probably about kindergarten through like fifth or sixth grade. Um, so when I played sports, when I was outside of my small town and meeting new people, it was something that was just markedly different in addition to my blackness in this rural area. So that was something that as I even graduated from high school, moved to Portland, Oregon, which is you know more of a city dynamic, then seeing people see me for the first time and, you know, maybe my blackness wasn't so much of a challenge then, but the difference in my face was something that brought attention in a negative way. I think my very heightened awareness and sensitivity to difference, um, to inclusion and exclusion and to trauma is something that really shaped not only me finding a path through Black studies in undergrad and public health with a focus on sexuality, where I really studied and explored African-American women's experience with childhood sexual abuse and how we leverage holistic healing approaches to overcome and demonstrate and experience resilience through those forms of trauma. And then in my doctoral studies, exploring medical education and how it prepares future physicians for providing cross-cultural care to diverse patient populations really shaped by my own experience navigating healthcare in my early life with scleroderma, but also, as I mentioned, through my pregnancy and some of the medical abuses and trauma that I carried from that experience. And so really my personal journey and my own identities my own way of being in dynamic and diverse spaces and in predominantly white spaces has really shaped finding a profession and a pathway of learning that could fill and heal my own personal wounds, as well as allow me to leverage my own traumas and my own growth in those identities and experiences to benefit others and to benefit institutions and systems. That's so inspiring. And I'm so sorry that you experienced that. And I'm really honored to be able to hear this story and turning a traumatic situation into helping others. And your services are so needed. I am so curious about when you go to a healthcare facility, what is a day in the life with Dr. Watch Washington? educating folks to do better? Each day is very different, but I will say in my process of engaging with institutions, I frame it as my process for engaging in action to cultivate equity or my peace efforts. So bringing peace efforts to healthcare institutions really tends to begin with engaging with leaders and especially coming out of 2020, where lots of institutions sort of claimed desire or commitment to increase equity, to open up especially critical race dialogues, 
And many attempted or opened up some of those spaces. And unfortunately, many have tapered off since. And so I really charge institutions with committing resources from their leadership, their time, their willingness, their vulnerability and honesty and intimacy. And so I open a lot of consultations with um, providing a grounding assessment where I'll listen to and create space for those who are more marginalized within an institution, those who are Black, Indigenous, and folks of color, those who through their positionality within an organization are further removed from decision-making, folks on the call lines or front desk or overnight shifts, you know, those folks who, based on their roles and titles, are also marginalized within the institution. And I will listen to them. I will explore their experiences and really amplify those stories and, and generate themes that I'll then use to coach usually some kind of core group of leaders, folks who through their titles and roles and positions have the agency to cultivate change and influence policies, practices, and institutional norms. And through a series of coaching retreats, I will work with folks who are able to cultivate change really by changing, really opening up their authentic presence in these conversations by having them utilize my online courses and build a foundation of racial and equity literacy. So oftentimes working with leaders, um, providing coaching, providing live trainings or follow-up for organization-wide engagement with my self-directed online learning and assessing organizational culture, policies, and practices are things that really take up a lot of my time uh, and that really allow me to gain a strong sense of the dynamics within an institution and then bring my expertise to help institutionalize some sustainable changes and opportunities for growth and repair. That's amazing. And the measured approach to ensure that it doesn't cause more harm is amazing. And the holistic approach really practice deep listening and move the judgment. And just observe and notice and have the ears to hear with curiosity. I was a patient and I have often said, I am a white lady with private insurance and yet my voice was not heard. I was a social worker for 20 years and I was in nonprofit leadership and I would tell my team, you know, I have privilege. I always say like, check your privilege, Karen. When teaching folks, like I feel sometimes that I don't have the right to speak on it, but, or, and I'm going to, because I used my position as a leader to say like, okay, if I have all these in place and I've been in the medical field for 20 years, I've been on the other side of the desk and they're not listening to me. What we're going to do is take our boots on the ground and make sure the patients that we work with, the clients, the folks, the individuals, and we're going to get their voice heard using our role and our title. So thank you for bringing voice to the marginalized folks that need care and having them bravery to do so. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I thought I had a good sense of what it was like because of my career. And when I became a patient, I was like, this system is so broken. And as a, a social worker, we look at systems. You know, we break it down, we tip it, tip it, tip it, tip it, and it's still broken. But we can fix it. And it takes people like you, Dr. Washington, to get to the leaders and get to the heart of the matter what really matters and give it voice. So thank you. Yes, thank you. I can really appreciate um, the reflection around knowing that you are committed to especially racial equity and injustice and a desire to amplify those voices, but with your own privileged identity, 
not necessarily knowing which space is yours to take up or not wanting to speak over on behalf of. And I find that to be very common among white folks, folks with institutional privilege um, that care about and want to contribute to change and yet aren't sure how to leverage their voice in ways that aren't going to perpetuate harm or further marginalize. So I really appreciate you naming that. And I think that part of what I am aiming to do is help folks of all races and backgrounds to find and own the space that is theirs in these conversations and in the efforts to cultivate change and equity in solidarity with one another. Honestly, I often want to play small because I don't know my role. I don't want to do harm, but I want to do the next right thing. It's a huge core value. And I'm a lesbian, so I'm kind of coming out every day and I have a kid and I'm trying to just show people that we're just trying to like live a quote unquote normal life pay our power bill, pick the correct school for our daughter, and keep it moving. And we just want to help. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I think one really good takeaway is just getting to the heart of what can cause further trauma when we're trying to do the next right thing. So that is a really valuable insight for me when I'm down here in the South trying to put the boots on the ground. So Thank you for sharing that. Where can folks find you? Tell us where we can find Dr. Washington so folks can reach out and we can we can get some stuff going. Tell us about it. Sure. So my online learning platform where folks can purchase courses and sign up for webinars as well as leverage an abundant free resource library can be found at criticallyconsciousconnections.com. Also institutions, whether that's hospitals, clinics, um, medical schools can also purchase bulk licenses and incorporate courses from Critically Conscious Connections into their longitudinal curriculum to fill gaps there. Also folks can find me and book consultation services, whether that's group coaching or one-on-one coaching for individual professionals through SharonWashingtonConsulting.com. I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook at Sharon Washington Consulting, also on Instagram at Dr.WashingtonAntiracism. Lastly, I'll just say sort of outside of my DEIA consulting, education, and coaching, I also personally have recently launched a literacy program in my community in South Jersey. And so if folks are interested in supporting a program that's working with pre-K through fourth grade children and providing monthly hangouts, um, book donations, and exercises and resources to strengthen their literacy, then folks can support that program at LIT, stands for Literacy in Transit, litprogram.org. Thank you so much. I want the listeners to check you out, follow you on Instagram, get involved with the literacy program. Thank you so much for being on the show today and fighting the good fight, Dr. Washington. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Living My Breathless Life. Head over to Instagram and follow According to HPG to stay connected to the show. Go get your mammograms.